Hi everyone, it's Natalie Antonov again here with Gable Music Ventures for another interview with the experts. We want to get you real life advice from real life experts who have gone through the music industry uh, or any other industry that might be able to help you get to your music goals just a little bit faster or easier. Today, we have Richie Rabini with us. He is a multi-instrumentalist, he is a producer, a songwriter, and also the drummer for 90s alternative rock band, The Caulfields. How are you doing, Richie? I'm doing well, Natalie. Thank you for having me here. It's cool. You, you look nice and chilly over there with well, your I, star it was phone. Cold. It was cold, a little cold, so I um, figure I'd, you know. Well, I'm right um, there with you. I, I have a little tea with me, so cheers to that. <laughs> all right, so let's start from the top here. We have a lot to talk about. Let's go with all of your experience in the music industry. In a very abbreviated fashion, of course, uh, you were a member of a largely popular 90s alternative rock band, The Caulfields. Uh, you signed to a major record label with them. You toured internationally. You became a professional musician, being featured on dozens of other artists' releases. You became a producer. Then you became a board member of the Philly chapter of the Recording Academy, and you started your own record label, Plus Five Records. Now, mm -hmm. the first thing I want to know is, did I get that all right? <laughs> you, you did. I mean, and yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's all there. Yeah, we'll, we'll kind of probably talk about it a little bit, <laughs> a little more, de a little more details, but yeah. Absolutely. No, you've got that. There's a, other people involved awesome. in all that, too. So it's, uh, but mm -hmm. yeah, it's all cool. What started this whole music thing for you? What's your first music memory? Um, let's see, my first music memory, um, uh, I, my father was, um, he was a, in real estate, but, um, we had, um, I was surrounded by theater, a lot of theater music, and I did a lot of that as a kid, and, um, musicals and all that kind of stuff. So, growing up, we were listening to, you know, Music Man and My Fair Lady at dinner time. Those are the kind of things that we're playing on the, the stereo, which was in the basement. Um, cool. So it was all that kind of show music and stuff. My dad was a great, had a great voice. And um, so it was just always around. And so I remember going to these rehearsals because he was in these plays and things. So I would help out backstage and help the, when they would do set changes. And I, you know, I was this little kid and I would sort of help them. They need to get like, they need to have like a jacket ready to go. So it's like, I'm holding it, <laughs> you know, you give it to them. And so those kinds of things, all that kind of music was um, some of my earliest experiences. Um, one, I just told this the other day, um, my, in the day when you can actually leave your kids in the car, you know, and, and go out, get your, your yeah, parents right? gonna walk out and leave you in know, a car, and, you know. <laughs> um, there was this, one of my memories was uh, my father, uh, my brother and I were in the car and uh, he had to run into this place, this other little house here. So, you know, parked on the corner. He may have even double parked. Could have been that. Somebody could have <laughs> hopped right in and, and took off with us. Drove but, away. Drove okay. away, but Revolution by the Beatles came on the radio and just that really crazy distorted guitar and everything. We actually were going nuts in the car. My brother and I were flopping around in the car, just flopping around mad. And it was making us that crazy and just so excited. I mean, we love the Beatles and all that stuff. And you know, we like the monkeys and things like that, but we love the Beatles. And when we heard that uh, we were, you know, you know, whatever, six, seven, eight years old, I don't know. Um. But we're just flopping around in the car, just going nuts, you know? Um, so, uh, that's, that's one of the, that's a great memory. So, for, and that's for experience. Is that what got you like, like, I want to do music just like that. Like, I want to be like them kind of yeah. thing. Well, no, it just kind of happened, uh, organically. I was surrounded by it. Cause like I say, all the theater, <coughs> excuse me, my brother was a really, um, talented musician and he, uh, was an amazing accordion player had won like all these awards in New York and international contests. And so he was kind of the glowing, you know, kind of, uh, <coughs> excuse me, music um, up and comer in the house. And I was, you know, a few years younger. And, uh, but yeah, I just started, uh, you know, banging on the, um, 
excuse me, um, the chair. <laughs> Somebody had gotten some drumsticks and I would play along with records, but I would sit myself on the chair and the hand rest or the arm rest was the, I would just sit there and play along to, to music. I put all these 45s on the, on the stereo and play along. So that was, that's how I got into drumming. And then I got a little <laughs> snare drum and little by little evolved. And then I took music theory in, in uh, high school. And then I sort of began picking up the piano and then playing the guitar. And um, so it's like I say, it wasn't, wasn't like we're going to groom this kid to do anything. <laughs> it just kind of happened one by one. So. No, that's really cool. That's yeah. uh that's a fun story. And 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 actually we're on the on the right path here because my next question was actually going to be uh when you when you joined the Caulfields uh, before they became this big thing, you know, you you had to start somewhere. You said you took some courses in high school. Um when did you join them and and how long was it before you were locally that popular band in Delaware? Well, there's a I get to go a little bit before that. I was in a band um you know sort of prior to that called honor society and we were mm. kind of like we would have lines out the door when we were playing newark we were like um a three-piece band and we did covers but we also put out a couple records of our own and we opened up for the hooters and stuff like that and we were you know people thought we were going to break out you know we had like a really good following and we were really kind of cool and and um but um yeah the whole and then i played Prior to the Caulfields, I played with a guy called Matt Severe. I don't know if you ever heard his name, but he was, that was in the sort of the early 90s, and he was very popular. We had a kind of a regional hit on WXPN. Mm. And this was prior to, I mean, this was sort of at the beginning of WXPN and that whole AAA format, which is, they sort of, them and like, I mean, there may be one or two other stations around the country created that what we know as AAA radio. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, they were playing the Hooters and all that kind of stuff, but there wasn't any regional bands they were playing, but we kind of had, we, there was a hit, it was a regional hit. And the, another guy, he was, he's a real good looking dude and great songwriter and- There we go. All right, so. All right, so I was telling the story about this guy, Matt Severe, <laughs> and we were very popular and we had a regional hit on, um, WXPN and we would do a lot of events and we were really packing them in in Philadelphia. We were really popular, but uh, I left the band and um, my brother, we knew the A&R guy at A&M Records, a good friend of ours, grew up behind us, mm -hmm. our house in Wilmington. Uh, he was in Los Angeles and LA working at A&M Records and he was a great friend. Um, my brother pitched the Caulfields to him and then he loved it and loved Devil's Diary and then one thing led to the next and then the band got signed and then um, all the touring and all that kind of sort of stuff starts to happen and, and then, uh, you know. So so when, I'm, I'm curious, when you come from, you know, small town Delaware and you go out into the world as the Caulfields, um, and you're you're working with this major label. Uh, what was the most uh, difficult thing to kind of get used to, or did you have to make any kind of sacrifices or anything to go do that? Um, well, it was for me the first time actually. I mean, I had done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of shows and gigs and this and that, but all of a sudden, you know, you're touring and <coughs> and. Um, yeah, it's cool. Uh, that um, that lifestyle works with me and my personality. <laughs> so uh, I, I I dig it, and um, I, I you know I dig it. And so uh, some people it doesn't resonate with them meeting new people and being in different towns every night and long drives and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it, it's I I'm, I'm okay with it. I'm okay with it. I get kind of I get energized by new towns and and meeting new people and we were always treated really really well by the label mm -hmm. um at least on the first record the second record things got a little more wonky which is um kind of a classic story with bands but that happens so, so. <laughs> i gotcha is there is there any piece of advice you would you know give someone <laughs> who's looking to kind of get into that if they got signed to a label kind of thing um just to kind of make their life a little easier well, I, you know, I don't know how much the like big labels are signing bands anymore. I don't mm -hmm. know about how that there's a lot of 
solo artists and it's just so different now natalie with mm -hmm. you know technology has um um influenced you know how music is made mm -hmm. records are recorded technology has always influenced how records were made and um each step of the way you know two track <laughs> two track to four track and then oh the beatles did sergeant pepper on four track and then oh then they went up to eight track and so technology has always um driven how music is made mm -hmm. and recorded mm -hmm. so it's no different in what's happening now with digital you know how people make records <laughs> So I have a little cold, so. Um, it's all right, man. So, yeah, so uh, people making records in their houses and all that stuff. Um, there isn't big recording budgets anymore like that, you know? So, and putting people out on tour, it's, it's, it's really a different scene. So I would just say, uh, make the best music you can mm -hmm. and uh, promote yourself, you know, uh, through all of the usual things that I'm sure Vince talked to you about. <laughs> YouTube and all the social media. Oh, and yeah. Get, you know, design your brand. You really get your brand together. And when people are independent musicians, there isn't necessarily guidance there. You know, yeah. people are, you know, and that's what record companies, to some extent, would give you guidance and help you along. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean that the band doesn't know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, they do know what they're doing. But uh, so independent musicians, it has given everybody a chance to say, see the vision and go for it and do it. People just want to know that what they're doing is um, is good. Now, you know, sometimes it's not good. And that's the guidance I'm talking about. You know, maybe you're not ready. Maybe it's not ready. Maybe this song is not where it needs to be. Go rewrite the bridge. Go do this. You know, these are things that's guidance. You know, why are you posting that on, on, on Instagram? That's not what an artist, an up and coming artist would do. You know, you need to make smart choices along the way. And um, so, and younger kids in this age, everything's so fast and and they, they post everything, you know, about everything and uh, mm -hmm. pictures of themselves doing right. everything. And everything. Well, if you are trying to be a recording artist, you better be really careful how you present yourself because it's out there, as you know, as we all know. And uh you know you want if you if you call yourself an artist well then act like an artist you know you want to have a you want to have a sense of, of present not a, that you're above people but i don't know there's a thing you know there's just a, a thing and it's it's how you hold yourself and and uh it's sometimes it's an intangible little thing but people that and i've seen it and i've seen it and i've seen it people that kind of cross over and have success they have a thing right They've got something and i'll say it's like not necessarily like wow it's charisma but there's a there's an there's a vibe and there's an attitude that says they're doing this and Absolutely. nobody has to ever say anything mm -hmm. it's just the it's a it's, it's a energy that comes off of people that says hey man you know you know i'm i'm doing this for real you don't even have to say anything it's just an energy it's a vibe it's an attitude and, uh, but it just pisses me off when I see, you know, people that, you know, are being artists and they have releases out and they've got this stuff and they could be signed to small independent labels or this or that. It's like, and the stuff they post, it's like, geez, Louise, what the hell are you doing, man? I don't respect you now. Mm. It's very easy to get sucked up into that kind of thing these days. Like you said, everything's moving so quickly and, and everybody posts everything these days. So it's, it's really important to kind of keep yourself not distant, but just aware of if what you, you're doing. If, if you want to present yourself as an artist, mm -hmm. as a recording artist, you know, they would say fake it till you make it kind of a thing, you know? Do you want to be, you know, perceived as somebody that's doing this for real? Well, then don't act like a dope <laughs> and, 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 you know, post dopey things. Because mm -hmm. right now, your music doesn't appeal to me now. Your songs don't appeal to me now. And you know, those are sort of unsaid things, you know, and that's just my point of view, mm -hmm. Natalie, um, the way I see it, you know, um, I would tell young artists and songwriters uh, before like things got crazy with all the socials and all that stuff. Just, I would, I would say this exact thing that I'm telling you right now. It's like, you know, if you want to be perceived as an artist, well, 
act like it. Act like it. Well said. I don't well mean said. like not. I don't mean not have fun, but just you know, because now everything is out there. You know, I think you know in the in the '60s and '70s and all this stuff, and in the '80s before all this, before the '90s when sort of the internet, artists did crazy, stupid stuff all the time. But you know, nobody had a a camera in their face or a camera in their hand 24/7. So a lot of that stupidity that people did, you know, it would only get in some magazines and stuff like that, but a lot of it I'm sure, you know, I don't know for sure, but I'm sure a lot of it went uh, a lot of crazy antics and stupid things were said just kind of flew out there either. <laughs> you know, just kind of went out happened. there, but uh, <laughs> nowadays it's all out there. You Everybody can't says hide. whatever's on their mind. Yeah. You know, I always tell people like, you know, don't you know, your people like they're putting out a record and then, you know, in these crazy times that we've been in with politics and stuff, it's like people like get out there and they're talking all this politics and, you know, you know, their stance on things like don't do that. Why would you do that? You know, I mean, I I just feel that it's again it's only if you want to you know you, if you, let me say this Natalie and I say this all the time mm -hmm. it's show business it's the entertainment business you're there it's entertainment now certainly you can make great stances and, and causes and and raise money for all the great things that you know that are dear to you and that you support that I love it that's what you should be doing as an artist but getting on some of these socials and kind of arguing with somebody about certain things it's like you know, you're you're an artist, man. You know, you don't you don't need to do that. You know, talk mm -hmm. about the things that you're behind, and and that's it. You know, and 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 that you support, whether it's you know, uh, sort of the environment or things like that, sort mm -hmm. of positive positive things. You know, no need to be arguing about with someone about politics in an open thing. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, and then you're you know, then people's records. <laughs> you know, people look at your music like ah, you know, it's like. You know, it's 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 entertainment. It's it, you, you know, we're entertainers. We're there to entertain. Right. You know, <laughs> so maybe, I hope I I got tangential. I knew I would. So <laughs> it is all good. We love the tangents here. We do. You know, it's easy to forget uh, if you're not necessarily in that mindset that you were talking about. So I think that's a really good point, and and I'm glad you brought it up. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so. Uh, aside from your touring and all that fun with the call fields, you, you also started mm -hmm. to play um, as a professional instrumentalist. Is this a word? It, what, what is it called when you're, you know, maybe a session artist or you go and you, yeah. you, you play for other people's releases? You did a, a whole lot of that. How'd you get into yeah, that? Did, and and yeah, what was that like? I did, all, <coughs> did a whole bunch of that stuff. Um, you know, I would do a lot of sessions in Philadelphia. My brother and I had this recording studio called The Warehouse in Philly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just, we were always studio rats, my brother and I. So we were always uh, like sort of, you know, the, the guys, you know, uh, I guess we were good. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> kind of. But we always sort of got sessions and, and uh, would mm -hmm. do all that stuff in addition to doing our own music and, and all that stuff. But um, with the second Caulfield's record, I started producing, uh, just doing demos for the songs and stuff and actually helping John and stuff. We were, I was diddling out of this studio up in Chad's Ford and doing demos and uh, they sort of sounded, they were turning out real good. And then, uh, so, and then we went to a studio in Newark to actually cut some real demos for a and m actually gave us money to record the, the demos for the second album but i just started getting more <coughs> into i mean i always was but now i had sort of this thing and i was able to to kind of really put sort of my talents you know starting my that <coughs> into play mm -hmm. and so yeah i started doing these demos and uh then i started people started asking me uh, after the call fields uh, to record them. And then one thing led another, and then producing, and then little mm -hmm. by little, you know. Um, so yeah, it just kind of evolved um, organically, really. I wasn't like, like, wow, I'm gonna be a producer, man. You know, it's just <laughs> like, I just had so much uh, time in the studio and worked on so many things and worked with so many other producers and engineers and stuff that I just had thousands of hours logged mm -hmm. in the studio 
doing all sorts of things, <laughs> drumming and singing and blah, 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 and, and you know, playing keyboards and doing stuff like that. So I guess all my experience kind of came together. And so uh, <coughs> that's what happened. So for you, it just kind of, it happened based off of kind of the situation that you were in. It wasn't something that you went out and said, okay, I just want to play music for other people. How do I do that? Because I'm sure there are some artists who, who would prefer to do something like that than maybe go out and tour and have that whole mm -hmm. lifestyle. They just want to have their music, you know, be, be used or, or, or it, it not mm -hmm. used that way. But I mean, like, you know, they want to, they want to produce it for it to be placed in, you know, movies or films or even in other people's, mm -hmm. you know, music albums that are released. Mm -hmm. um, but there, I'm sure there's a way to do that where it isn't just like it, it kind of just happened like organically. A uh, good friend of mine, uh, Nick Dadia, did some work with the Caulfields. Um, he uh, was is a Grammy winner. Did all Pearl Jam and Stone Temple Pilots and all these. You know, one, he's a Grammy winner. Bruce Springsteen, three records, and everybody you can imagine is a good friend of mine. And we, I had done a lot of work with him over the years in Philadelphia, and he was, you know, in California at the time. And um, he asked me after the Caulfields in 1999. He said, "Hey, man." I was down at his house doing some work in Atlanta. I, that's where I started doing a lot of work in Atlanta. He said, would you uh, play me some stuff by this guy, this guy, Sean Smith. And he said, would you be interested in, uh, who was in a band called Brad and Satchel. And that was the guys from Pearl Jam, but it was mm -hmm. their side projects. Right. And this guy was really, had a brilliant voice. They were from, from Seattle and they were signed to Epic and Sony. And he said, would you be interested in, in uh, working with this guy, Sean, doing a record? And I was like, hell yeah, this guy's great. You know, he was kind of like Prince, but he was sort of in the Seattle world with all the Pearl Jam guys and all that kind of stuff. And, but he was from ba originally from Bakersfield, California. But anyway, I said, yes. Yeah. So we, we set it up and uh, we did, let's see, was that after or before? Oh, wait. Okay. Well, anyway, um, uh, yeah, that was, that would have been after. Okay. Before that, <laughs> he asked me to play on a record with this girl called Joan Jones. And she was on Hollywood record. She was managed by Prince's manager. Okay. So I played on her record and did it in Atlanta. And I ended up, and I remember I was said to Joan, I was down there for a week. Did, I think I did two couple weekends. And I said, um, oh, I'd just be happy to get on a couple of tracks. And she said, Richie, what do you mean? You know, because there was other people that was were coming around and playing on the record. And I thought, ah, if I get on a, a song, that'd be great. I ended up, you know, getting on a lot of the tracks and playing some keyboards and singing and drumming and all this kind of stuff. And really great. She was a real great songwriter, kind of Cheryl Crowish. Um, she was a native Los Angelino. And mm -hmm. um, so anyway, I uh, played on her record and then I ended up touring with her. And uh, that was great. And uh, and then I think that's when I was asked to do the Sean Smith thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so I we did that in Atlanta. And um, yeah, so just one thing led to the next. And uh, he had songs in The Sopranos and all kinds of stuff. He was a really great, he just passed away about a year and a half ago, mm -hmm. kind of unexpectedly. Um, just, and like I said, he had a lot of songs placed in TV shows. And uh, I remember hearing a Dawn dishwashing liquid commercial, I was like, that is Sean. That's got to be Sean. <laughs> <laughs> I know Sean. So good guy. We had we made a great record with him, but we started a record company mm -hmm. called 818 Music. Mm -hmm. And I was home at that point and we started this thing and then we I was shipping CDs out because he was known all around the world cuz he would play uh with the guys from Pearl Jam on these big Australian festivals and all this kind of stuff. So anyway, I'm shipping out CDs all around the world from my dining room table, <laughs> you know, and then we did a, an acoustic, we had two releases. Anyway, they're collector's items now. You can find them on the internet, but they go for a hundred bucks or so uh, each. But, uh, but anyway, so yeah, that's how that all happened. I just, we just kind of, you know, and then plus five records came a little bit later than that, but uh, yeah, so that's how that all worked out. And then, um, yeah, just kind of was busy doing that. And then I was producing a lot of these, some artists from around here and co-writing some songs with them. And they got placed on TV shows, MTV. And so you think you can dance and all these kind of shows. And again, Natalie, it just happens. It just happened. <laughs> it happens it. organically kind of, you know, and, do you, and do I, you I, submit I, for those things or do they come well, to you? Do you have an those, agent? Those, those, no, <laughs> those, those, those just happen because like the girl that I was producing and uh, I covered a bunch of her songs with her really good. And, and uh, she, um, uh, 
some uh, music supervisor from MTV, you know, just kind of dug her stuff and uh, used all of the songs that we ever did, you know, and um, I think so I cool. co like five, five songs with her. Um, and, uh, but we were on uh, The Hills. Mm -hmm. Remember the show, The Hills? Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember that. Okay, we were on just The Hills. Bit. and then Just a little bit. <laughs> you caught the very, okay. <laughs> Binge watching The Hills. Uh, Binge watching uh, a lot of things now, right? Yeah, yeah. But anyway, yeah, so, uh, yeah, and just, you know, just organically these things happen and then, um, I don't really know these things, you know. I was working with this girl Maggie a few years ago, Maggie Gabbard, and then mm -hmm. again I got a call from an email from this guy from New York. Uh, a guy puts stuff into films and all that stuff and TV shows, all, all these Bravo shows and all stuff. And um, I just get an email, uh, and he said I'm would like to, you know, with I think Maggie's catalog would work well with our stuff we do. I said, okay, and so, um, and I said, well, what do you think? And he said, well, I, we dig all of it, you know? Uh, so again, but that just, and I said, well, how did you hear about it, hear about her? He said, it just came across my desk. So I don't plan these things, you know? So, um, you know, and then right. so we got placement, got placements <laughs> out of that, you know, we got some placements out of that and, and so on and so on. So again, there's no sort of always a grand design. I always tell people, um you got to throw the darts mm -hmm. you got to keep throwing the darts because you'll hit a bullseye eventually right it's the law of averages you know whether it's going to be life-changing event or anything but you know most artists that i see just want to say that you know they don't they're not necessarily have designs to be bruce springsteen or mm -hmm. or anything or tom petty or anything they just want to know that people dig their stuff you know, and that, hey man, I got something. Somebody liked what I did and, you know, it's something to be proud of. That's all people want, you know, mm -hmm. so. I get kind of choked up about it because it's important. I do, because I've seen so many artists and they're not asking for the world, man. They just want, they just want a little something. Just add, I got a song, I got a song in a show, man. Somebody loved, liked my stuff enough to put it in and so, um, so it and it is cool. It is cool when you get when you hear your song on a TV show, you know, or in the, even if it's in the background in a bar, you know, it's still it's still good. So, no, that's okay. I knew I would ramble. I, Natalie, I knew I would ramble. It is all good. <laughs> <laughs> it is all good. Um, there's they, you've got so much good stuff. I mean, this is this is it, it's important to know that not everything it, that you do is it, it, directly going to end up getting you there you know what i mean that a lot of it is also what you said it just came across my desk or you yeah. know stuff like that like it's important for people to know that you know you, you can work really 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 hard do everything right that doesn't necessarily mean anything but but you do have to keep doing it and you do have to keep trying because yeah. it, it's incremental yes. it's incremental it is it's incremental it's like it leads up to i always say it's like pink it's like a I've used this analogy many times. It's like a, a, a pinball machine. Mm -hmm. You know, you hit a bumper and it takes you to the next bumper and it takes you there. Everything is kind of like, yes. just kind of, bam, it's getting you there. But you got to keep going. Mm -hmm. You can't stop. Persistence is the key. You know, you got to do everything you can with where you are at. You mm -hmm. know, you know, yeah, you're looking towards the future, but you got to do every, you know, <clears throat> got just got to keep doing it. You got to keep throwing those darts, you know. My buddy who I, I told you about, the, the guy from Atlanta, mm -hmm. who's very, very successful. He's living in Australia now, working and producing and stuff there. Um, I did a record with him, co-produced a record with him in 2012 with these four sisters. They were called Von Gray and they were very young and they were phenomenal. And um, they were kind of like organic Americana. They were mm -hmm. really great. And uh, so we did like a test weekend and uh, because they had worked with other people and other people were getting all these session musicians to play their stuff and all this kind of stuff. And we're like, you know what? They're really talented kids. Let's see what it's like if they play their instruments. Come on, for this to be real, you know, instead of some manufactured thing, you know. Um, so we did it and it turned out great. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they decided to do the record with us. And um, 
then I went down to Atlanta again and worked went to the family's house and did all these spent the weekend with them and I brought all this recording gear with me and they set me up with all these microphones because uh, um, and I did demos for the song for the, all the record just me and the girls again a lot of those cool arrangements work, ended up working on the record so then we did another like two weeks and did the record well they ended up on David Letterman and mm. uh, on and um, uh, Conan okay they were phenomenal. So then again, you know, it's just this thing that sort of happened and, uh, but they were really great. And so, and so again, I've just been kind of continuing honing my sort of producing uh, skills and my, actually my mixing and engineering uh, skills. Mm -hmm. I never had any grand design to do it. I would always, I would bring Nick up to Hocus in a lot up to Delaware from Atlanta to mix a lot of my stuff and sometimes engineer my stuff. He's a Grammy winner. Bruce Springsteen, everybody. I mean, um, he's done some of the biggest records in the last 20 years, for no doubt, for sure. I mean, he did all the Stone Temple Pilots and Pearl Jam, all the, those great records, and, and goes on and on and on his uh, discography. But I would bring him up to Wilmington and, and stuff to help me out <coughs> doing stuff, and he would mix my stuff in Atlanta, and I would go down to Atlanta. So again, it's just little con con big contacts along the way, then you, you know, just never always cultivated those lifelong relationships and as people get along in their career they're going to help you out you know like him asking right. me to play on this record with the girl from you know uh from la and so that's how one thing again it's not some sort of <laughs> mapped out thing and i think that's true of everybody natalie i think anybody that you know sometimes there are little little fluky things that happen but you know you're just and i'm still just kind of moving along you know staying creative and right. all that well, i'm hearing i'm hearing a lot too um kind of as an undertone that you also kind of have to be open to these things you know happening to you and and the the uh, opportunities that come to you and, and you don't have to say yes to everything but you kind of have to be open to these kinds of things and, and moving around and and is that what i'm hearing like you just kind of have to go with it sort of thing yeah well when i was asked to be in the call fields I knew at that moment I, I was approached and I remember I thought about it for about two five seconds and I said and I said this is this is an important moment I need to I need to do this I need to take this opportunity mm -hmm. but I knew it there was a voice inside my head that said do it do it everybody if you continue to work hard and or and and, and get good at whatever it is you do, mm -hmm. whether you're a lyricist writer, whether you're writing dance tracks, whatever it is that you do, don't stop because you'll never know if you stop. You'll never know, right. you know? How would you know if, 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 you know, if something would have clicked that week after mm. that you decided to, the week, you, do you, the week that you decide to, after you decide to call, hang up, hang it all up, and then there could have been some great sort of <coughs> opportunity that was fluttering out there in the universe. It was coming right towards you, your door, oh. and, and you, you know, and you, and you quit. If it's something that you like to do, uh, just keep doing it. Just keep doing it and getting better at it. Mm -hmm. Say whatever it is, drum, you know, whatever your instrument, your, your singing or whatever it is, writing lyrics or whatever, you, you know, whatever it is, engineering, producing, learning a certain program, learning a certain, um, that was another thing I, I, <clears throat> I worked, with a pro, uh, program called Pro Tools, mm -hmm. and it's sort of like the standard, the standard of the industry. <clears throat> my my friend, I was telling you about. I was working in some recording programs in my basement here, and uh, I stopped touring because I had my daughter. And um, he said, "You should get yourself uh, an inbox." And I was like, "What's an inbox?" <laughs> and it's a it was this it was a kind of a new kind of thing, and they were like these little two channel. Uh, interfaces um, and you got the Pro Tools software on your laptop and all this kind of stuff. So, <clears throat> and I said, cool. And um, it's funny because I do remember, I just was congratulating because he won a Grammy for the uh, the Rising, the Bruce Springsteen record, The Rising. And mm -hmm. so he said, you should get this. So I got it. And he started sending me all this cool literature about Pro Tools and all these sort of sh keyboard shortcuts and all this kind of stuff. And I just sort of dug into it, man. And I just started really got dug into learning the program. And I started making music immediately. Mm -hmm. And I actually produced some stuff literally on my coffee table using this interface and, 
and all that. And I'm sitting in here, you know, in this dining room playing, recording acoustic guitars and everything. And then because of the standard, I set my stuff down to Nick and he would mix them in these big studios. Now here is something I tracked on my coffee table. So it just shows, it just, you know, and that was that girl that I told you how we got mm -hmm. all those placements. So, you know what I mean? That showed me, okay, well, you, you know, certainly the industry, things are changing because this sounds amazing. And I just cut this on my coffee table. Yeah, right. That is you know, amazing so, technology. So, like how, how does yes. it, how can it sound so good just from your coffee table? Well, that, and that's why where it is now from then it's even beyond crazy now with all the great technology and you know, it's all, it's all good. They're all tools and you got to learn them and embrace them and, mm -hmm. and um, don't be afraid of it. Learn it, you know, learn it, man. And it's, uh, you know, you don't have to necessarily make your, make your, you have, are making record, but go to somebody else to help you realize these ideas, but use those tools, you know, um, so that are available. So people don't realize just, you know, with, with their phone, all these amazing sort of like cool apps for recording and keyboard apps on your phone. So, and, uh, you know, you can fly them around and bring them to other studios and it's great. So it's cool. That is really cool. And I think that's true. I think in, in any kind of industry or, or job really too, just keeping up with the technology to make sure that you to. stay relevant, because if not, then, you know, if somebody asks you to do it a certain way, are you going to be able to send it to them at that point, you know, the way they need it or want it, you know, so yeah. you can work, collaborate well, with other people. Uh, the, the technology has been great because it's rewrote the, uh, sort of the rules of collaborating with, writing and all that kind of stuff people sending beats and sending chorus hooks and this and st all this kind of stuff uh has really changed and it's great it's fantastic and that's great that's actually not, like really interesting point because i was going to ask you you know how how the coronavirus and, and quarantining and all that has has affected your career it sounds like some of this technology um you've been really helpful for people to use have, you know, mm -hmm. during, during this, have you used it yeah. a lot now? Is this what you're doing normally? Uh, well, I will, I've always, since all this, I've been doing all that for, you know, nothing new, you know, <laughs> 10 or 15, no, like trading files and all that stuff and tracks and vocal, you know, I've been doing that. So it's no, no real, no, no big difference really for what I'm doing. So, um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's super cool. And it's actually kind of how we, um, um, I don't know if you were going to go there, but um, the new Caulfield ah, single. Yes, you uh, read my mind. Yeah. Go for it. <laughs> okay. Um, we had always done um, Love Will Keep Us Together as an encore when we were touring. It was the only cover that we did. I think this, some of the le the second record when we were touring, we started doing uh, Kodachrome by Simon and Garfunkel. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know if we still did Love Will Keep Us Together, but my, Love Will Keep Us Together, people knew us for doing this cover. And I just said to John about four or five months ago, I said, why don't we actually do like a real version? We had cut a, a kind of a, kind of a raucous version uh, in Philly um, back in the day. And I said, why don't we do a real kind of thing? And uh, him and Brett, uh, again, talking just about what we're talking about, recorded the guitars up at Brett's mm -hmm. and, uh, <clears throat> And then I got all their tracks mm -hmm. and then uh, I recorded the drums uh, here at Studio 825. Wasn't really trying to give a plug, but I <laughs> uh, rec recorded the drums and then the bass all down here. And then John came down and sang and um, uh, did the background vocals and I sang and I did keyboards and the mm -hmm. percussion and all that stuff, incidental stuff. And uh, I mixed it. So uh, I mixed it, but there you go. They recorded the guitars there, and then we did all the. I did all the rest down in Wilmington um, at Ray's place, and um, and there you go. And so you, ha they, you know, that's kind of a collaborative recording effort in a way, you know. So, um, which is fun, and I think it turned out smashingly. Smashingly, and and this is this is the one that is that was just released uh, December fourth. That's correct. Okay. Yep. And this is a, it's a benefit kind of 
uh, really yeah, so that you're making, you know, a fundraising kind of situation, right? It is. It's a uh, band camp. Uh, you can find it on band camp and mm -hmm. don't, um, all the proceeds are going to fill abundance, mm -hmm. but now we're doing, um, we're doing another thing. Uh, we just did a streaming event mm -hmm. and, uh, some of that money's going to the Delaware food bank or the food bank of Delaware. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, we're just trying to spread the love and, and, uh, give some, you know, do some good and, and, um, and I think we have a real fun track and um, have you heard it? Not yet. No, no. Right. I have to get well, into it. Check, <laughs> I was, it, out. check it out. I was waiting um, to talk to you. I was, I, right, I'm so excited. Cool. So cool. wait. Well, it's out there. It's out on Spotify and all that stuff. And, okay. So. so the Phil Abundance one, just to, is that one still fundraising open? Yes. It's, yes, it is. Okay. So it's going to be open. Yep. Okay. Yep. And then the other one that you mentioned after that uh, for the food bank. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure how to direct anybody to get that to okay. that. All right, just yet. So okay, that's well, look out new, for that. New, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but let's see. We're uh, we also have a um, yet to be released uh, lip sync video, mm. which is coming out. Uh, uh -huh. I'm not sure when that's coming out. It could be in a couple of weeks. And it's got some folks from Philly, uh, David Asikinen from the Hooters, mm. um, Richard Bush, Lauren Hart is in it, and her husband, Todd Carmichael from La Colombe Coffee, um, mm. and a lot of uh, local Philly people and local Delaware faces that you, <laughs> I know, are going to recognize. So, <laughs> that but, should be uh, fun. <laughs> we're keeping it really under wraps right now, and it's going to be really fun, and we're just uh, waiting on a feature on some websites and things. WMMR, I think, is going to doing some work for with some NWSCW mm -hmm. <laughs> so you have I'm sure some you know personal social media pages but also the call fields what are what are the different handles that people should go to um I, I think uh John Fay Music on Facebook mm -hmm. there's also the call fields on Facebook okay and uh same thing on Instagram it's John Fay um, and then John Faye has a website, johnfay.com. Okay. A lot of the stuff you'll find there too. That's so. where, okay. So that's where everything lives on there. Awesome. So we're nearing the end here. And I always have one question I like to ask uh, all my interviewees. Uh, what one piece of advice would you give yourself, um, your younger self, in, in how to get to your goals and your dreams faster? Don't, you, you may not expect this answer. Don't expect anyone to do it for you. Do it yourself. Don't expect anybody to lend, lend a hand. Mm -hmm. You will be lent a hand at some point. But you got to have the mindset that it starts here. Okay. Don't, 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 don't wait around for other people to do what you know is best for you you do it and that's you know i wish i took my own advice when i was younger very inspiring thank you okay <laughs> um all righty so uh thank you we are uh we're pretty much done for the day and i appreciate you taking some time out to uh talk to me from your uh you know dining room table <laughs> all right right all right thank you natalie it's been a pleasure i hope i didn't bore you and you know with any anything because ah. i i will go off sometimes so. no it was totally totally perfect i want to thank everybody who's watching as well and we are going to have some more interviews with the experts coming in 2021 um if you have anybody you want to see us interview please go ahead and leave it in the comments like subscribe please we love it <laughs> And uh, yeah, so just let us know if, uh, if you missed anything, if you have anyone else you want us to talk to, um, any other topics you want us to cover. For now, that's it. We'll see you next time. Thank you so much, Richie. Thanks, guys. Peace. Thank you, Natalie. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you, Gable.